Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. You know, everybody's been trying to figure the coronavirus out. We have wonderful researchers around the world who are dedicating themselves to try and trying to learn why this is happening, how it is happening, and most importantly, what can we do about it. One area that I've not seen uh, much research in is the area of the microbiome. And, you know, when you recognize that the microbiome, the gut bacteria, uh, and its m metabolic products and, ge and genetics play such an important role in two things, inflammation and immunity, one would think that this might be an area that we should explore. You know, when we see data now indicating that uh, here in the United, United States, uh, there seems to be more hospitalizations of younger uh, people, when we see uh, that there may be an increased risk for complications in people chronically taking uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. When we note, for example, significantly lower cases uh, or uh, prevalence uh, in uh, places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and even Haiti, one would wonder, again, if there may be some connection uh, to the microbiome. So I decided to create uh, this presentation for you to explore uh, these thoughts and reveal what the science has told us in the past, and maybe this is then a call to action to explore a new area as it relates to this coronavirus. Coronavirus, COVID-19, and the microbiome. First, I'd like to explore what we know are some of the powerful risk factors uh, for having uh, for uh, having bad outcome as it relates to this infection. Certainly cardiovascular disease ranks amongst uh, the very uh, highest, along with things like diabetes and obesity. Uh, certainly being elderly can't really change that. Chronic pulmonary disease, chronic liver, chronic kidney disease as well. Uh, recent chemotherapy and even recent uh, radiation therapy are related to uh, increased risk for having uh, more complications, more severe illness, and even chronic neurological diseases like Parkinson's are related. And, you know, this discussion, I think, takes me back to some of the work that we've done previously and uh, really lets us recognize that what is going on here that seems to be so uh, similar or shared is that by and large what you are looking at are situations in which there is increased inflammation. I've been talking about this uh, inflammation as it relates to the brain for quite some time, looking at things like Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's, autism, multiple sclerosis, stroke, depression, uh, coronary artery disease as well, not a brain disorder, diabetes and obesity. So we recognize that these conditions, many of which are now described as being uh, associated with increased risk for more severe disease uh, as it relates to coronavirus are at their core inflammatory. And we have been discussing for quite some time the important role of the gut bacteria in regulating inflammation, in regulating the immune system. So let's have a look at that. Let's look at some uh, of the science. This takes us back to uh, 2011 looking at the commensal flora, the gut bacteria, and the regulation of inflammatory and autoimmune responses. Remember that the regulation of inflammation is key as it relates to coronavirus. When we have a good situation, a high fiber diet, natural birth, breastfeeding, exposure to microbes, meaning playing in the dirt when you're young, etc., this tends to stabilize the gut bacteria in, uh, con and leads to good resolution of, uh, of inflammation, gives us good integrity of the gut lining that is so important uh, for maintaining inflammation at a low level and balances our immunity. When, however, we are uh, exposed to medications like antibiotics, uh, obesity, the standard Western diet, overly involved with hygiene or stress, something we can certainly uh, get involved with uh, or, or control these days, and certain pathogenic bac uh, bacteria that causes what's called dysbiosis or disturbance of the gut bacteria, and that ultimately predisposes us to inflammation, cancer, and autoimmunity. autoimmunity. 
what we're really focused on right now is the inflammation part of that story. Well, this is an interesting study, and it looks at the impact of diet in terms of shaping the gut bacteria, and it's a comparison study, and you're gonna, I think, really appreciate where this goes as it relates to the current data of coronavirus, which we're going to look at. And it looks at uh, the gut bacteria in a couple of areas of the world. Age-matched children, either living in Burkina Faso, which is a rural African area, we're gonna look at that in a moment, versus European children and looking at their gut bacteria. Burkina Faso in uh, Western Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and we know that it is a, an underdeveloped area. This is uh, one of the villages uh, in Burkina Faso. This is what the um, a typical uh, dwelling looks like. This is uh, making uh, grinding uh, millet and sorghum out in, uh, on a wall out uh, where you know, it certainly could be uh, not as uh, sterile as our food might be. And then these things are ground into uh, the typical uh, po or toe rather, that is what they, uh, this is called. But in comparing the, the array of bacteria in the African children gut bacteria versus the European, dramatic, dramatic differences, and even in some major categories like Firmicutes and Bacterioides. Children have, uh, in Africa have a far different array of bacteria, and as we will see in a moment, this has huge effects in terms of uh, things like immunity. And the authors of this study concluded that our results suggest that diet has a dominant role in shaping the gut bacteria, gut microbiota, and we can hypothesize that the reduction in richness that we observed in the European Union compared to Burkina Faso children could indicate how the consumption of things like sugar, animal fat, uh, calorie-dense foods in industrial countries is rapidly limiting the adaptive potential of the microbiota. We'll explore what that means in a moment. I, in thinking this through, had thought back to an interview I did with a Dr. Molly Fox. And Dr. Molly Fox approached something called the hygiene hypothesis, which was originally proposed, we'll look at that in a moment, 1989. But she wanted to look at it in reference to Alzheimer's disease. And she studied uh, people across the world and wanted to determine, is there a relationship between Alzheimer's and inflammatory disease and hygiene as measured by something called the parasite load? And I'm not going to challenge you to look at this chart. I know that it's very challenging, uh, but she uses parasite load as a marker of hygiene. Obviously, higher levels of parasites, these are different countries, 100 countries, uh, higher levels of parasites in areas with lower levels of hygiene. And here's what she found. I made it simpler. That increasing parasitic stress, like in Sudan, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Chad, etc., was associated with lower risk of an inflammatory condition that we call Alzheimer's. Now this is a very, very important finding because we are now noticing that the areas on the right side of your screen are some of the areas in the world that are having the lowest infection rate of coronavirus. Now, I will absolutely accept the argument that these are areas where there is less international travel, but I'm not sure that necessarily holds true for India, for example. If you look at the top, you'll see places like the United States and Italy uh, and Germany and even Iceland, where 1% as of today Today is March the 19th, 2020. Even in Iceland, 1% of the entire population is now infected with coronavirus, population, I guess, around 340,000 people. And uh, again, one could argue that that's an area of travel. But when we think of the millions and millions of people and the population density in some of these uh, African nations, it does beg the question. I mentioned the hygiene hypoth uh, hypothesis. I uh, copied this from Wikipedia. The hygiene hypothesis in medicine states that early childhood exposure to particular microorganisms such as uh, the gut flora and helminth parasites, meaning the bacteria that are found in the gut, as well as worms, protects against allergic diseases, 
by contributing to the development of the immune system. Strengthening the immune system, balancing the immune system by being exposed to a non-hygienic environment. Again, I think we should consider uh, uh, northern countries in Europe versus uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa as an example. It is in, in, intriguing. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get there in just a moment. Here is a headline from 2010. A magnitude 7 earthquake hit uh, Haiti. Well, when this happened, uh, I jumped on a plane, flew to Haiti, and uh, realized that, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of great medical facilities at that point. Things were very stressed. And this is uh, the UNICEF tent where we were uh, treating patients. This is uh, inside that tent. Um, and uh, these are not necessarily, you know, the typical sterile, hygienic kinds of environments where we would hope to treat patients with devastating injuries. But uh, what we noticed that was really quite profound is that these people had really aggressive injuries. And what we noticed in, in treating them was that there were very few infections. And again, I think it's a testament to the robust immunity was my, my conclusion as I left, the robust immunity from the fact that they don't live in such a hygienic environment, strengthening their immune systems probably through what it does to the microbiome or perhaps what it doesn't do to the microbiome with respect to the way uh, we treat our gut bacteria with medications, antibiotics, chlorinated water, uh, you name it. So think about that when we look, this is from today and I know that uh, this map will definitely change. Uh, this is looking at coronavirus activity, but look at the disparity between Africa and Europe. It dates back, in my mind, to the original study I showed at the beginning of this uh, presentation of the differences in um, the gut bacteria in comparison uh, uh, to Bur uh, Burkina Faso uh, children, Sub-Saharan Africa, West Side, to those in Europe the gut bacteria play a fundamental role in regulating our immune systems. And again, another image taken today, and I know this will be out of date soon, India is a very dense population with lots of travel. Compare that uh, to uh, other areas of uh, Asia where the uh, rates of this virus are absolutely exploding. Well, today we learned uh, this interesting fact published, uh, actually it was published yesterday, but I learned it today, <laughs> that CDC is telling us that about 40% of patients, um, uh, that 40% of patients sick enough to be hospitalized are between the ages of uh, 20 to, I believe it is 54. That the, the point is that there are younger patients being hospitalized. And that is something that we didn't see uh, in, uh, until this sort of spread to, um, uh, to the United States because one wonders then, what is it about our kids that's making them at a higher risk? And I would submit it's because of the modern Western diet that they are consuming. We also uh, found this study uh, that was published two days ago. Ibuprofen should not be used in managing symptoms, say, doctors and scientists, why? This was published two days ago uh, in BMJ. Well, we know that ibuprofen changes the gut bacteria uh, and can do so quite aggressively. Uh, we've known that for quite some time. We've been blogging about that for many, many years, that drugs like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as well as acid-blocking drugs, have a significant effect upon uh, the diversity um, and array of gut bacteria, and this can affect immunity and may actually lead to increased inflammation. We know there is an association with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and, for example, risk for stroke and Alzheimer's disease. So what threatens our microbial diversity antibiotics? Not saying we shouldn't use them. Of course we should use them, but I think it's quite clear that in developed countries, especially the United States, we overuse antibiotics with 70% of the antibiotics used in America actually going into poultry and cattle. Method of delivery affects the gut bacteria of the newborn and uh, infant being born either vaginally or via cesarean section. Medications I mentioned, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs 
and um, acid blocking drugs. If our water contains residual chlorine, that could be a threat. The diet is such an important factor, a highly um, uh, processed diet with high levels of um, sugar, for example, threatens the gut bacteria. I don't know that there's any uh, data that suggests specifically that GMO foods threaten the gut bacteria, but we do know that one of the things that is increased in our diets when we're eating a lot of genetically modified foods is the chemical glyphosate. The work of Dr. Stephanie Seneff clearly indicates that has an effect on the microbiome. And finally, as we've learned based upon Dr. Strachan's work in 1989, this hygiene hypothesis whereby excessive uh, uh, efforts to in, increase hygiene may have an effect on the uh, array diversity of the gut bacteria. Ultimately, this can lead to increased gut permeability, and that is a direct pathway to the uh, process of inflammation. So then as we look at these issues that we know are associated with increased risk for uh, complications, bad outcome, we should look at these things uh, through the eye of, or the lens of the gut bacteria. So I believe that the gut bacteria is very, very important in terms of our understanding of the pathogenesis of the uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, I'm hopeful that some of my colleagues uh, in this uh, field will uh, do their best to sequence uh, what is going on in the gut of those individuals who have good outcome versus those who have bad outcome. So we can begin to uh, look at that data and try to make some sense out of it. And hopefully thereafter, uh, begin to uh, create novel ideas for interventions to uh, perhaps help individuals, not only with the ongoing disease, but even perhaps as a way to reduce uh, risk. Uh, that said, I think it makes sense to keep your gut bacteria in uh, as good a shape as you possibly can. And that means doing your best to reduce your consumption of highly processed foods, of uh, simple sugars, uh, making sure you're getting a lot of dietary fiber, things like, and especially prebiotic fiber, garlic, onions, leeks, kale, broccoli. Uh, you can find the list certainly online. You can go to drperlmutter.com. You know I've been interested in this for quite some time. You can buy a, any uh, over-the-counter brand of prebiotic fiber, uh, and that would be helpful in my opinion as well. I can't imagine it's going to hurt. Uh, certainly uh, be very considerate about your usage of medications like uh, proton pump inhibitors, acid blocking drugs, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, and certainly antibiotics. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there are times when medications are necessary. Infections that are caused by bacteria need antibiotics. I'm certainly saying not to do that, but we should consider uh, the possible overusage of antibiotics in Western uh, countries and how that might have an effect on the microbiome and perhaps how that might be relevant in our understanding of COVID-19. Thank you for listening. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter.